So calving management. Calving management, like I mentioned earlier, is not only an important thing for the cow, but also for the calf. If you think about the risk factors on the cow, you know, you have a 100 pound calf that's, that's being delivered. So you can have internal injuries, you can have internal bleeding, you can have fractures, you can have a wide variety of different things that will impact the cow. If you think about the calf from a calf standpoint, it's equally traumatic. We can have broken ribs, again, internal bleeding. We can have anoxia, the inability for the calf to get oxygen. And all of these can contribute to, to significant challenges that happen in early life. One of the consequences to having difficult calvings or dystocia is, is having stillborn calves. A stillborn calf, as many of you know, is a calf that dies at birth or within the first 24 to 48 hours after birth. This, this um, uh, graph is from the National Dairy Study, uh, which is a study that went out and surveyed about 1,000 dairy producers across Canada. And what they mentioned was that 5% of the calves on, on their farm um, died at birth um, or within the first 24 to 48 hours. The interesting thing is you see a huge distribution. So on far some farms, this is a, a significant issue, like these ones down here, about 8% or higher, you know, pretty significant issue on their farm. But some farms, you know, it's a non-issue, less than 2%. So not only is this a huge welfare concern, again, back to the consequences like I mentioned earlier, rib fractures being painful, inability to get oxygen, and distress that's associated with that, but it's also a significant economic issue. For every stillborn animal that's born on the farm, it costs the producer about $900. And a lot of that is related to calf mortality, the opportunity cost to not have that animal come in as a replacement in their dairy herd. But we also have the cost that's related to the dystocia event in the cow. So we have, you know, dystocia event. We also have the cost of discarded milk, increased drug and veterinary costs, increased risk of being culled, um, decreased milk production, and also the, an increase in the days open. So all these consequences will lead to about a $900 cost uh, for uh, the dairy producer for every stillborn calf they have. If we think about how to monitor stillbirths on, on a dairy farm, it can be done quite easily. You know, about 70% of, or 60 to 70% of, of farms are on uh, DHI or Lactinet and record this um, pretty regularly in that program. So using Dairy Comp, you type into your command line events backslash three, and this will give you this calf report or this calf table which gives you a ton of different information where you have, you know, number of freshenings, you have the proportion of twins, percent females, percent alive, and also percent dead. So on this particular farm, they are 2%, which is a great farm and what you'd strive for. Goal ideally is to be less than 5%. And this is a goal that's been generated by the Dairy Calf and Heifer Association in the United States. So this is an example of a herd that, that potentially is having a problem. So again, back to the freshenings, 167, you know, alive, dead, percent dead, about 9% on this farm. So this is a farm that, that's having some challenges. Um, and we'll kind of explore the different risk factors that you could work on um, if you have a herd that's having a high level of stillborn calves. So if we look at the three main factors that are associated with uh, stillbirth rate on, on a dairy farm, there's a couple things that you want to consider. The first one is calving management. Um, which is a, a significant thing that we can really manipulate and improve what, what's happening with the producer and, and provide some education on that. There's also the age at first calving and also nutrition. And we'll go through each one of those individually. So if we look at calving management, I think, again, we can break it down into three main factors that we can manipulate to improve calving outcomes. The first one is their movement prior to calving. The second one is their calving supervision that we're providing. And the third one is when we're intervening or providing the right intervention at the right time. So we focus on movement prior to calving. So movement is not an issue as long as the cow is moved, ideally within two days prior to, prior to calving, or at the onset of stage two of parturition. And what the onset of stage part two of parturition means is the feet or the amniotic sac are out the vulva and the calf's ready um, to go through the calving event. When we run into issues, if we're moving cows um, at the onset of stage one of parturition, um, that's when we're going to run into you know, some, some, longer, some bigger issues. So we might have a longer duration of calving, we might have a higher level of assistance, and we also have a higher risk of dystocia and perinatal mortality. And that's related to these, these cows that when you're moving that stage one, one of parturition, when the cervix is dilating, they're going to go and they're going to try and start exploring their environment to make sure that that's a safe calving area for them to have their calf. 
And that's why we have that kind of delay of that on or the progression uh, of parturition. So the next thing, like I mentioned earlier, that we can manipulate is calving supervision. And the qual quality that we do for supervision can have a huge risk um, or a huge influence on our risk of having a dystocia or difficult calving event. If we look at what the most reliable signs are of impending parturition, just by looking at the cow, we can see in, if when we start having relaxation of the pelvic ligaments, utter and teat filling, parturition should start happening in about 12 hours. The challenge with that is it's a very subjective me measure, so it makes calving supervision very difficult on many farms. It's also hard, calving supervision is hard on, on smaller farms um, because we don't have the labor that's necessary to go and provide that 24-hour supervision. One way that you can get around that is through the use of camera surveillance, but I'm sure you've been to many farms that, you know, there's lots of dust on those and, and not commonly used, and that's because you have to actively go in and look at those cameras. So one of the ways that we can provide better calving surveillance or ca calving supervision is through the use of monitors. And that, that really is an active way that we can increase the frequency of observation without provide, needing the labor um, that's required to do that. So one of the good ways that we can start monitoring calving supervision is through monitoring body temperature. So what happens when a cow enters into um, parturition They'll have a drop of about one degree Celsius in their core body temperature. And that happens about 48 hours prior to calving. So that'll give the first alert to the producer that that partition is going to occur within 48 hours. Also, with, when you use these temperature boluses, like the ones that go into the vulva, when they get expelled from the vagina, you also will have another decrease in body temperature. And that will alert that, that the cow is in stage two of partition. Another monitor you could use is the use of an activity monitor. So activity monitors are really common on farm, um, mostly through estrus detection. And what happens with these activity monitors is that they'll start to increase the number of steps that they take, um, mostly around the stage one of parturition. So about eight hours prior to parturition, we'll start to have an increase um, in the number of steps that they're taking. So that can alert the producer that, hey, something's happening. And, you know, within eight hours, this cow might calf. The challenge with it is that the there's only about 70% increase in the activity that the cows have. So many of these activity monitors do not have the proper threshold to provide an alert that this cow is calving because most of them are set on estrus detection where you have a 140% increase in activity. Next monitor is rumination monitors. So that about, about eight hours prior to parturition, you have about 70% decline in rumination time. And the largest drop occurs in the final four to six hours prior to, part prior to parturition. So that's nice because you can provide, the producer gets provided with an alert to say um, rumination is dropping, this cow might be close to calving. Another monitor that you could use is one that monitors tail position and movement. And how this particular monitor works is that as cows enter through stage one of parturition, their, their tails will start to be elevated or raised for a longer period of duration. And if the duration of the tail, you know, raising um, stays high for a longer period of time, um, it'll send an alert to the producer. And this particularly occurs about two to six hours uh, prior to parturition and is a reasonable way um, to um, alert to the producer that parturition is occurring. So what's gained with all using all these monitors? I think what's gained is that we improve our active surveillance of parturition. So it provides an alert to the producer to say, this cow is going to calve soon. And then they can potentially use calving surveillance or go into the barn more frequently to ensure that this cow is progressing over time. The final thing that I think we can manipulate is, is using is um, calving intervention. So if we look at it from a purely academic standpoint, you know, when to intervene, um, an intervention should be applied when a cow is in labor for more than 70 minutes after the onset of stage two of parturition or when the feet or the amniotic sac are presented to the vulva. The challenge is it's really, really difficult for a producer to identify, you know, that the onset of stage, the onset of stage two of parturition and really time out that, that 70 minute um, duration or window. So a more realistic way to intervene is really to, um, you know, examine the cow when you first see her in parturition. And an intervention should be applied if the amniotic sac has brown, red, or fetid fluid, or there's cotyledons present, 
If you see that the tongue, head, or feet are swollen and cold. If you have malposition of the calf, if you have twins, or you have poor fetal reflexes. That's when you should provide intervention when you examine that animal at first. If everything's total and totally normal at first exam, you really just want to monitor progress. And you want to ensure that progression is occurring every 30 minutes. And if you're not getting progress, or the calf has poor signs of vigor, then you should intervene. The next thing that's associated with stillbirth rate or, or prevalence of dystocia is nutrition. And it's really important that we provide, obviously, really good nutrition um, in the last trimester of gestation, not only for the transition cow period, but also for ensuring that we have a good uh, calf that's born. If we look at nutrition in the dry cow period, really the, the most important thing from a calf health perspective is that we feed them not in excess or not in inadequate nutrition, especially in the last trimester. If we have access nut or excess nutrition, we're going to have a larger fetus that's born. We're also going to get the buildup of fat surrounding the birth canal. And what that, that will do is it will decrease the diameter that we have to have this calf delivered, which you can see in the pelvis down here. Um, it's also becoming an issue in, in cows that are dried off at a high body condition score. So there's many farms that use a one group TMR. Um, these cows are out in late lactation, not producing a significant amount of milk. Um, and they're dried off at really fat body condition scores or high body condition scores. And because they don't lose weight over the, over the dry cow period, um, they can be a, a significant challenge um, to having a, a calf um, at the next onset of the next lactation. Inadequate nutrition is also an important uh, factor to consider as well, and maybe more important in, in heifers. So if we're not providing the, cow, the cows or heifers with enough nutrition, we're going to reduce pelvic size. We're also going to get reduced placental and fetal weight, and that will increase the risk of dystocia and perinatal mortality. And a lot of that, that is related to uterine inertia and also the inadequate relaxation of the pelvic ligaments. If we have micronutrient deficiencies, particularly deficiency in vitamin E and selenium, we also have a higher risk of perinatal mortality. So we really want to ensure that we have a well-balanced ration that we're feeding to cows in the dry cow period. One of the ways that we can monitor how well um, designed the nutritional program is, is through doing body condition scoring. So ideally, our body condition score goal um, at dry off is 3.5. Calving, it's 3.5 as well, and also heifers for calving is 3.5. So a really easy target is, is having 3.5 all the way through. So monitoring that, ensuring that they're reaching those goals is really an important way to ensure that the ration is balanced appropriately. The final thing that's associated with the stillbirth rate is heifers. Heifers broadly are at increased risk of having dystocia and also at increased risk of having a stillborn calf. And a lot of that is related to the age at which they're at which they're calving, but also the body weight at which they're calving as well. So like I mentioned earlier, first calf heifers are really at the highest risk of dystocia. And we really want to ensure that heifers at the appropriate weight, also the appropriate age. Um, and that will improve production. It also improve our efficiency and reduce the cost associated with rearing heifers. And ultimately will minimize the risk of dystocia and perinatal mortality. If we're focused purely at age and trying to optimize the age of first calving, again, to improve our efficiency and our heifer rearing, our target age of first calving is anywhere between 22 to 24 months of age. When we calve them at between 22 to 24 months of age, we'll maximize the milk production and we'll also reduce the risk of dystocia and reduce the risk of perinatal mortality. And this is important to note that it's lifetime milk production. However, just making a blanket statement about age really is not appropriate we cannot forget about body weight. Um, it really is a balance between age at first calving and weight at first calving. So if we calve out an animal at 500 kilos compared to an animal at 600 kilos, we get about a 3.8 liter per day increase in that uh, animal that calved out at 600 uh, kilos. So it's really, really important that we ensure that they're at not only at the appropriate body weight, but they're also at the appropriate age because we can maximize the efficiency while maximizing their milk production, especially in the first lactation. So if we look at breeding and calving targets, ideally we want to you know, breed um, um, our heifers at 13 to 15 months. We want them to be 55% of mature body weight, and which mature body weight means is that we're going and we're measuring um, third or greater lactation animals to see what the mature size is in the specific herd. So ideally we want them to be about 55% of that. And we want them to be hip height about 50 to 52 inches. 
And one of the ways that works really well in some of the herds I work with is by putting a, a red piece of tape on the headlocks or on the wall somewhere where you can see and what their hip height is to make sure that they're appropriate size. At calving, we want them to be 22 to 24 months of age, which is about 85 at 85% um, of their mature body weight and 53 to 56 inches at their withers. So just to conclude this bit on stillborn or stillbirth rates, stillbirth rates are a big challenge on many dairy farms. About 50% of dairy farms in Canada have a stillbirth rate that's greater than 5%. Than 5% and I think that we really do need to address that on, on our herds. If we think about ways that we can you know, manipulate or change our stillbirth rate, or even change the stocia rate on, on herds, we can look at calving management, you know, movement prior to calving, calving supervision, and calving intervention are all important areas that we can use uh, to tackle this issue and reduce or improve um, the outcomes that we have um, with our difficult calvings. We can look at nutrition, ensuring that we're providing well-balanced uh, nutrition, especially in the third trimester. And the final thing we can look at is, is ensuring that our first lactation animals are well-grown. Um, so we're not only looking at the age of first calving, but we're also looking at the body weight of first calving.